Well, hello. Uh, welcome to this evening's lecture uh, that the NJAM team have uh, kindly asked me uh, to, to... The overall aim of my session is to look at how we support human performance within aviation and ensure humans are optimally integrated into aircraft systems. I know um, uh, Pete Hawkinson's lecture covered some of this as well. Uh, one of my passions is identifying and helping to close any gender data gaps in aerospace medicine. So I think it's really important that data we use and the research that is undertaken also considers the differences in humans and doesn't just apply data collected from um, less diverse times uh, to ensure we're really doing the, the best we can. Um, the theme tonight should bring together my experiences and journey in aerospace medicine to where I am now, um, having just completed an MSc in aerospace medicine. Uh, and by the end, uh, you'll find no surprises that my research project uh, focused on urination and aviation as just a way to model this. Um, so I hope you're sitting comfortably. If not, take advantage of not joining me from the cockpit. Uh, press pause and... Um, all I can say is uh, time goes very fast when you're having fun. Um, here's a little bit about my career in aerospace medicine, but I've built in a few side discussions on aeromedical evacuation to give appreciation of the varied role military aircrew medical examiners undertake. Um, and so this isn't just a, a, a why me, I promise. Um, I'm a GP in the Air Force and have been uh, certainly a GP for 12 years now and in the Air Force for 20 years. Um, I'm currently a visiting fellow at King's College uh, London within the Department of Aerospace Medicine uh, and this was arranged through um, a research uh, scheme that the Royal Air Force has to, to help us grow and develop. Um, and so whilst I'm not a specialist in aviation medicine in, in any way, shape or form like um, Bonnie, Jerry and Alistair are training to be, um, hopefully you'll see that um, aerospace medicine shapes a lot of the clinical practice I undertake and that, that being a GP is a really interesting way to, to approach aerospace medicine. Um, I initially wanted to be a pilot in the RAF uh, but found my way to medicine as a much better use of my interests uh, and it, I think it also helped me to hold my arms were too short for military flying. Um, I went to Bristol Uni and continued flying and being submerged in military life within the UAS and this was a great way to have a, uh, you know, a group of friends with interests similar to mine um, but not just me. I did my foundation years at Dereford uh, down Plymouth Way and then following that we go off and do our uh, officer training uh, and for us in the Air Force that's RAF College Grammar which is the picture here. I then uh, got sent to uh, do my general duties which is a time really just to experience the Air Force and, and see what the added elements are uh, before you make any really firm career decisions. Uh, so I was really lucky to go to Cottesmore, North, which is in Rutland, it's now a, um, an army base, um, but it's where uh, some of the Royal Harriers were based, and actually we did a joint force with the Royal Navy as well. Um, and I bring up jets that are confined to museums uh, these days, but it really was uh, a great opener into single-seat operations uh, and carrier operations uh, and the added risks that are inherent to these. Um, my GP training uh, time was done uh, in various hospitals and Oxford Way, so at RAF Benson where we had the Merlin and the Puma. Uh, and I also got to spend some time in Cyprus, uh, where there is a multitude of jets that come through, and we even had a visit from the uh, Red Arrows whilst I was there, they do their um, spring training camp. Uh, and at the time I was there, it was a, a really important uh, <clears throat> strategic location for providing aeromedical support and just sort of passenger transfer, so known as an air bridge. Um, between the operations we had um, in Afghanistan and Iraq. So it was a really interesting uh, place to be. Um, my uh, experience at Cottesmore understanding more about the Harrier came into uh, you know, really good use when sadly there was a Harrier crash on the runway um, whilst I was shadowing the duty doctor. So we got to respond to that. And I know Alistair spoke about uh, some of the pre-hospital care skills that are needed in um, aerospace medicine and certainly out in Cyprus, uh, where we don't have um, a 999 system. Um, and it, it was a great example of how there is so much overlap between the pre-hospital care skills uh, and so aviation medicine awareness when you're looking after airfields and, and the crew that fly from them. Oh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about austere environments later when we come up. Um, so having completed my certificate uh, in training in general practice, uh, the fun really began and we have to pass all the same um, sort of tests. We follow the same curriculum as anyone uh, undertaking GP uh, training, and that's the same with any specialty we do. 
Um, so I reached the end and then the fun stuff started and I went uh, back to Cyprus, uh, but actually to an army base, to Episcopal Garrison. Uh, and it was great. The secondary healthcare uh, provision was limited on the island. Uh, so we end up uh, using the strategic air and medical system to fly people back to the UK to, to have operations and, and follow up appointments. Um, so that was my first uh, sort of uh, input into air and med as a, as a qualified doctor. Uh, and this can often be done in quite urgent situations when we need to get them back. So you get into um, the experience of, of how you then task patients and how you prioritise them uh, and what the special considerations for the uh, the actual transit are going to be based on their clinical need uh, and <clears throat> the altitude, so for example, head injuries then. Um, Cyprus provided a great introduction to the aeromedical environment um, and I went from there to um, Afghanistan, so I, uh, my first operational tour was at Camp Bastion uh, where you end up wearing many hats and some of the aeromedical uh, base hats there were um, number one being the um, aeromedical coordination officer, so being the doctor that's providing that input um, in Afghanistan uh, with discussion with the UK who are overall controlling the, the um, evacuation operations um, but looking at how we get uh, people home to definitive care so our roll four which was at the RCDM so the Royal College of Defence Medicine in Birmingham at the time um, but there were also uh, things more locally that needed doing so uh, what we call tactical aeromed. And obviously you'd have heard of Mert, and that really is the uh, the, the the tactical sort of bring people from the the battlefield to um, sort of a first level of care. Um, I wasn't involved in that, um, but some of the roles that we had were transferring patients between the two main operating bases we had, so Kandahar and Bastion, and we used the Hercules for those uh, when they were needed. Uh, and then a really interesting part was um, repatriating um, local civilians who unfortunately had been injured and uh, underwent our sort of definitive surgical care. They were then taken um, back to uh, sort of local systems, which are quite often non-governmental uh, organisational run hospitals like uh, in Bost. Uh, so that was a sort of lunchtime hop on a helicopter to, to keep those beds clear. Now, it, it really highlighted to me the importance in military terms of air and medical evacuation because the big role for us there was keeping um, the hospital um, at a capacity level where they could surge um, if there was uh, something going on on the ground uh, with our troops so that we knew ethically uh, that they could undertake those and come back and receive the best care so just keeping sort of um, things flowing through the back door um, made sure that, uh, that those beds were free. Um, on return from Afghanistan, uh, I had a really fun time being part of um, the deployable air medical response teams. <clears throat> this is based out of Tactical Medical Wing, uh, and it's uh, basically a rapid reaction primary healthcare team that may go um, anywhere in the world uh, to do anything that's required at the time. So we had uh, non-combatant evacuation operations out of Libya. Um, I did some medical reconnaissance in um, East and uh, North Africa. So we were there during the Arab Spring. And some of these pictures here from Libya where we were looking at what was left um, <clears throat> of the airfields and whether they were going to be safe for some of the, um, the aid flights and uh, the sort of governmental support to, to Libya as it rebuilt itself, that they were going to be safe. Um, also got to do some uh, interesting uh, work supporting the counter-terrorist teams that, that we have within the UK uh, and also went out to the deserts of Jordan and had some, some good fun uh, looking at how um, we do pre-deployment training for uh, mountainous environments. Uh, I then returned to the Rotary World uh, based out of RAF Odium uh, and was part of the Chinook Force. Um, it was great. We went to America and again did um, some desert training, in, including sort of practicing their survival skills should they sort of ever be downed uh, within a desert environment. Um, went back to Jordan and also got to go to the Falkland Islands, which I want to uh, sort of do a special mention of. Um, not everyone knows really how far away it is and how little land there is between uh, Bride Norton, so our main operating base uh, within the United Kingdom and the Falkland Islands, uh, so it's 8,000 miles <clears throat> and uh, down there we have support from the equivalent of a cottage hospital. So it's a really interesting place that's managed by 
some highly specialised GPs. So they are, you know, GPs. They're not, uh, you know, completed full surgical or anaesthetic training, but they're able to provide um, a level of service. Uh, but quite often we need to um, get anybody who's unwell down there, including um, sort of the local population, onto a higher level of care. So this can take some interesting planning and coordination. Uh, and one time I was down there, we had an acutely psychotic patient <clears throat> and trying to manage them whilst also considering their safety and the safety of other passengers on the aeroplane uh, was really interesting. And we actually had a security detail as part of the aeromedical team uh, just to ensure that it should anything get out of hand, um, <clears throat> that, that, that everything that would be needed uh, would be there to, to sort of calm the patient and keep them safe. Uh, and then on a, a different encounter, um, we have a search and rescue facility there. It's no longer run by the military, um, but we will still be asked for our opinion as the military doctor down there. And uh, there was a fishing vessel that, that came within uh, range, uh, within the waters, with a, a fisherman that had unfortunately been injured um, by a, a buoy uh, falling on the on the deck and had a significant head injury. So we were giving advice to that while still unable to reach it with the helicopter and then sort of making plans about how rapidly we were going to transfer them from the Falkland Islands, uh, again, to receive the adequate level of, of care to deal with their needs. Um, an absolutely fascinating place. Uh, the weather <laughs> uh, can provide challenges as well, from the wind to delay in the aircraft um, to sort of the environment leading to some quite significant trauma if things go wrong. Uh, and of course, there are lots of penguins, which is one of the uh, big reasons why people like going to the Falkland Islands. So you've probably picked up we do a variety of things as a military GP and we go where we needed and provide clinical and occupational advice. Um, when I'm somewhere like um, RAF Odium or um, Benson, uh, a large part of my working week is providing primary health care um, to the population. Uh, and this is also including occupational medicals for our aircrew. And that's something we're trained to do from the very start of our careers when we do a military aviation medical examiners course. Uh, so we always think with this extra um, sort of layer of intrigue about how this is going to, to bear out within the aviation environment that they work within. Um, the great thing is that we're supported by a wide network of experienced um, aviation medicine specialists and consultants, uh, which makes it um, always an interesting and, and good learning experience. So that was uh, the first five years really um, post uh, becoming a GP. Uh, I then uh, moved on to some more senior positions and was the branch advisor um, for the medical branch for a little while uh, and then got the absolute privilege of going on to do the diploma in aviation medicine <coughs> um, and I did the full course. Um, this was a great course, uh, six months where I really got to develop my appreciation of aerospace medicine and outside of just the military sphere, so you get to have a look at um, the civilian sectors and how the European Space Agency are working um, and you know, go back to basics, so really learn um, physiology with the, the aim of understanding its role within um, uh, the, you know, the, the aviation world, whereas back when I first learnt it, um, I certainly didn't uh, think about how I was going to then be applying it uh, later. Uh, and we also had some uh, you know, great experiences learning more about the survival side of stuff. So, you know, should um, air crew uh, crash, uh, how we can then support them to, to learn more about recovering well uh, and as retrieving them. So the end of the Diploma in Aerospace Medicine unfortunately timed with the start of the pandemic. So I uh, returned to primary health care for a while, um, but then more recently have applied for um, a period of academic reflection um, through what's known as the Chief of the Air Staffs Fellowship Scheme. So um, the Air Force have supported me in joining King's College for a while uh, as a visiting fellow uh, and within their Department of Aerospace Medicine to explore um, a project in depth. So what I've chosen to do uh, is look at whether there is a gender data gap within aerospace medicine and what effect this may be having on diversity within the flying branches. Uh, and these are sort of the, on the military side. Um, it's you know, an interesting concept and, and not always understood. Um, so I think the best way of doing this was to find um, some kind of topic that we could then use as a model to demonstrate what the gender data gap may look like. Uh, and this resulted in a research project being undertaken 
have a master's um, in aerospace medicine where I looked at urination and behavior, um, urination in aviation and looking at whether the behaviours uh, around managing urination, whether they had become maladaptive in any way, and if they had become maladaptive, whether this was representing any occupational risk to our UK military air crew. Um, so we'll come back to this, but let's first get into aer some aerospace medicine topics. Uh, and this is my favourite definition of what aerospace medicine is, as defined by um, <clears throat> the Aerospace Medicine Association, ASMA. And that's the determination and maintenance of the health, safety and performance of persons involved in air and space travel. Um, a gender data gap may be presenting itself in a couple of ways with the application of this. We've predominantly had male air crew as aerospace medicine has grown and developed alongside aviation. And if an assumption is made that this male data can be applied to all humans, then we risk setting conditions that may not be favourable, um, especially to, to new females joining the, um, the group. Uh, and there's a real spotlight on this in sport and physiology at the present. Um, and additionally, we may also be disadvantaging some of our air crew if we don't and ex explore and research areas that are of particular relevance to women that we've not needed to look at before. Um, for example, sort of uh, the effect of hormones. Um, and this isn't, by the way, about outing misogyny or anything like this. It's just more about acknowledging that um, some female specific issues just may not have had focus because they've not needed to. Um, but the world is changing uh, and we need to make sure before we sort of accelerate forward into what we're calling the next generation, uh, as you all are, the next generation of aerospace medicine, uh, that we're not taking any hidden bias with us that they then may become more ingrained and harder to, to resolve any problems uh, in the future. Um, and certainly looking at um, sort of my peers, my cohort, we're nearly um, sort of 50% female within the uh, RAF GPs. Uh, so we come with a new perspective and a new lens uh, to, to look at this all. Um, I think that's what's really important here is that quite often um, as we've tried to sort of drive forward equality, we've de-emphasised, we've minimised the differences. Um, but like all humans, male and female air crew have differences and it's really important as um, physicians that we acknowledge this and factor this in into how we apply the best medicine. Um, the UK military reopened its military flying roles about 30 years ago uh, and this was you know, a great example of diversifying policy uh, and to make this really work we then need to make sure that there's an inclusive culture and, and uh, you know, women are allowed to thrive within this group um, and not expecting them to sort of homogenise with those that exist, but actually there, there'd be some adaptation uh, by the organisation to recognise the, the needs of this new group. Um, but I think equity is also really important, so exploring whether these individuals have the same access to opportunity and an ability um, to perform to their very best um, compared with the, the, the pre-existing mainstream. And this was really sort of some of the um, inspiration behind uh, the project uh, was whether there is an, an equity of opportunity. So I'm going to just talk you through now some of the differences that may impact um, air crew performance that, that arise through gender and things that you know, then lead us on to having to consider them within uh, design uh, and application of um, aerospace medicine and the kit and equipment we provide around that. So, Anthropometrics are um, a set of measurements uh, and they can be sort of size data or strength data uh, on how we perform uh, and women are naturally smaller than men but they're not just downsized uh, versions of men, uh, the proportions and how um, bodies are uh, put together are different uh, and that has a, a bearing when we look at things like thermal regulation shortly. Uh, and also strength. Women are, are typically um, have less grip strength uh, and upper body strength than, than men. It's now really not as relevant as it was within the early days of aviation where um, strength was important and being able to control the aircraft, um, but it is a, a consideration. Uh, male and female anatomy is uh, understandably different, and that's from uh, things like breast tissue and how that impacts you wearing body armour or uh, wearing um, uh, bulks and how pressure is applied. Um, hips and how that then impacts um, the application of um, uh, sort of G-suits. And looking at my sort of urination project, just where um, the gentle anatomy sits, it's very different if you're in a seated position um, and need to access that anatomy to urinate and how you're then going to be able to do that. Um, I said earlier, 
the way uh, the proportion of the body is different um, comes down a lot to adipose tissue and where that is and that affects your buoyancy so things like checking um, how you are going to float uh, in a life jacket if you have to eject is important to make sure that um, there isn't any disadvantage in uh, you know, one gender is more likely than the other to to drown because of how their body then sits naturally within the water um, voice communication um, the voice communication systems within aircraft are um, designed on a male voice range uh, so sometimes in some conditions it can be hard to pick up the female voice which is interesting when uh, typically uh, in radio communications a female voice is easier to hear so there are some of the things that, that need to be considered Within physiology, um, looking at sort of uh, the non-reproductive hormone side first, um, thermoregulation is different, again, due to the distribution of fat within the body uh, and how quickly um, a female will cool down compared with a man. Um, women are unfortunately uh, slightly more predisposed to motion sickness, um, but this can be trained out. Uh, there's no great difference found in um, the difference to acceleration forces, so um, your G exposure. Um, but interestingly, the physical adaptation, so when you're sort of measuring um, the cardiovascular system and how that's doing, um, women don't seem to show the same level of adaptation, but it doesn't affect um, the actual sort of operational delivery. Um, and there's no data that's found any difference in the risk of decompression sickness. Other um, significant physiological considerations uh, come from a, a female air crew's ability to reproduce should they choose to. Um, pregnancy uh, within an aviation environment for, for a member of the air crew um, presents many challenges and certainly within the UK military um, we preclude female air crew from flying when pregnant um, and these risks can come from the external environment so things like cosmic radiation, um, the operating profile of the aircraft so what acceleration forces may do, the military role uh, so whether uh, individuals may need to take anti-malarial medications uh, and then down to things like uh, vibrations within the cockpit and what risks this may produce. And then practicalities, you know, how can you be safely restrained with your um, increasing uh, uterus size and how would you safely um, access and egress the, the aircraft as needed. Um, contraception isn't a bar in any way to flying, um, but just the timing of some of the uh, longer acting reversible contraceptions may be considered within your flying programme. Um, but contraceptive um, use to control uh, menstrual flow can be really useful and is chosen by many uh, to try and remove the need to, to manage menstruation. Um, as we'll see in a bit, uh, even urinating on some aircraft can be um, difficult, so to then have to manage menstrual flow alongside that um, can introduce some problems. Um, but there are, are times in a woman's career where they, they, they may have a vaginal bleed that can't be managed, um, so how do we support them best? Um, hormonal influences like mood and whether there are any disturbances that would affect their ability to fly um, if they do suffer from premenstrual syndrome. Um, and then as we come to the end of the reproductive uh, potential uh, and the menopause, this deficiency in hormones that then presents itself, um, what symptoms may have aeromedical relevance, for example the brain fog, the, the memory loss, uh, whether the hot flushes may be distracting and not all women will have symptoms but certainly all female air crew will go through the menopause and it's how best we can support them during this phase of their life. Um, from a psychology uh, aspect uh, the, we all come from very different cultures and backgrounds and how these then interplay within the airborne environment is a consideration. Um, we all have different training and learning styles um, and it would be really interesting to see um, if there was a different pathway in training now that we have more uh, sort of augmented reality uh, to see really if we can get to an individualised pathway of training um, that really enhances everybody's uh, individual potential. Uh, but there has been um, some studies that just look at the stages of flying and there are some parts where um, women will find it easier than men and vice versa. Um, but usually there's just sort of one system uh, fitting all to get people through training pipelines. Um, men and women um, make different behavioural choices and it's not to say you know it's one or the other, uh, there is of course overlap but at the extremes of that uh, it's really interesting. Uh, and things like um, thermoregulation, women are more likely um, 
on, on paper, as it were, uh, to suffer with heat illness uh, at certain times within their menstrual cycle. Um, but they are also more likely to do sensible things like change their environment, so take a layer off or open a window. Uh, so we don't actually see any differences in the presentation of heat illness. Um, and risk-taking behaviour is, uh, is different on the whole between men and women. Um, studies done in uh, the rotary world suggest that there's no difference in operational effects, so the ability to, to deliver the task. Um, but it, it is a consideration uh, with how we train and develop and get the best out of it. So pick up any health and fitness magazine and you'll be messaged about being hydrated. Um, there are a few myths out there about the optimum amount required. Um, it honestly varies between individuals and varies on a daily basis depending on what you're up to. Uh, looking at this from a homeostasis perspective, the body keeps a constant eye on our sort of blood osmolality uh, and the kidneys act as a filter on the system. Uh, 150 to 100 liter, uh, 180 litres are filtered a day. Luckily, 99% is recycled, um, but the kidneys need to make urine to filter and excrete waste. So the optimal way of checking everything is okay is monitoring your urine colour uh, and relying on thirst can lead to acknowledgement too late. So even though you feel thirsty, uh, your actual reduction in body weight by fluid loss uh, can be enough to have some symptoms of dehydration. There's also an added challenge of how do you drink in certain aircraft. In most jobs, we continue to drink throughout our working day, except uh, perhaps on some really busy ward rounds. Um, but within training sorties, the duration is usually short, um, recognising the cognitive load. But when you then move into operational fly, uh, these sorties can sometimes extend to be in excess of six to eight hours, uh, supported by airway refueling. But keeping hydrated with minimal space in the cockpit and whilst wearing other equipment um, may be a challenge. Uh, so we need to drink and certainly one of the biggest demands on fluid requirements uh, is heat load experienced by the body and there are many sources within a flying environment that can increase the heat load uh, being experienced by the body and, and the body having to manage it um, and we use sweat as a method as, of balancing this heat um, so within the aviation environment the additional heat stress can come from, from things like um, the equipment we're wearing, so if you have a look at this setup from things like the flying suit, the Jisoo on top, the survival vest, LPU, the harness, a uh, helmet over your head, uh, stopping um, heat loss from, from sort of one of the biggest surface areas. Um, you'll have undergarments on underneath this, uh, and if you're over water then there'll be an immersion suit, uh, which is it's very well insulated because the aim is that it's waterproof should you end up uh, in the ocean. Um, looking at the environment that you're actually operating from, so certainly within the, the Middle East or you know, even the UK on particularly hot summer days, there's a lot of radiant heat generated that can reflect um, into the aircraft and uh, sort of heat the tin can that the aircraft is while sat on there. So there are things that are done to try and reduce the heat load, sort of putting it under shelter and reducing the amount of work done on the, um, the walk around that the air crew uh, take place. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to do this. Um, there are um, environmental uh, conditioning units, so air conditioning within the aircraft, but these are predominantly there um, for the equipment uh, that, that need to stay cool rather than the humans themselves. So until you're uh, actually moving, um, it's unlikely to provide any significant cooling. Looking to the middle picture, um, flying tasks can actually be very physically demanding, and especially when we look at our rear crew, uh, you know, in our fixed wing and the rotary platforms. Lots of moving around, operating perhaps weapon systems or providing a lookout and additional situational awareness if there's winching going on or underslung loads being managed. Um, Parachute sorties, uh, the works, the, the crew in the back work physically very, very hard. Um, and this needs to be considered uh, with how they're able to then hydrate and, and try and cool down within all of this. Um, so fluid is, is needed to try and balance this. Um, if we are dehydrated, the body needs uh, for, for the body's needs, we begin to get warning signals like thirst. Um, but this can sometimes come too late. Uh, we've already lost a significant proportion of our body weight um, to, to signal that dehydration. So it's not necessarily reliable and we may already be suffering from some cognitive or physical performance decline, uh, which could impact potentially um, the, the high risk flying environment. There are other symptoms that can present a risk, so um, some things like distraction from the headache that may form, um, reduced cognitive performance, um, 
really makes dehydration something that we like to avoid on the whole in the military, but especially within um, the aviation environment. So in summary, uh, we need fluid. How much depends on what we're up to, but whilst flying, it's likely to be an increase on what we're doing on the ground. However, the kidneys are unhappy if not producing urine following their incredible uh, filtration efforts, and this urine must be eliminated, but the bladder can only hold so much before demanding this elimination, and the signal only gets louder and louder. So the big question is how do you manage the challenges of elimination whilst flying? So I'm just going to take you sideways a little bit and let's have a look at um, some of the at the moment. Um, let's look first to the fixed wing fleet. Uh, I'm going to focus in on the, the Hercules, the C-130J, a timeless classic, uh, certainly older than me, uh, so the facilities have a little to be desired. I did ask some friends for UK versions of these photos, um, but my inbox remains empty, unsurprisingly. Um, on the left, we have the only sit-down facility, uh, which is suspended uh, quite close to the rear ramp. Uh, this is affectionately known as the honey bucket uh, in US uh, flying circles, and it leaves the, uh, the user sort of suspended above the back cabin. Um, there is a shower curtain in the UK version, which comes around um, to provide some level of um, flying suit. Um, but it's drafty down the back and uh, sometimes uh, th this can lead to a, a little bit of peril. And bear in mind that a lot of UK flying suits are one piece. Uh, so for females, we certainly will, uh, you know, if you're using it uh, for something other than urination, then you'll be suspended hoping for a smooth transition uh, with your clothes around your ankles. Uh, so it can be quite a vulnerable position to be in. Um, should this be blocked by freight, there are some urinal options. Um, which for women will, will require some kind of um, translation device or something like the GP um, to, to be able to use it. Moving on to the rotary world, you may have a pilot relief tube or a hole in the wall. Um, tails of frozen pipes uh, lead to uh, aircrew proceeding with caution. And again, um, if you're um, feeding an aircrew, then use of a translation device would be needed. However, many um, helicopters uh, have nothing integral as their sortie profile didn't warrant it in the design phase. And, and quite often, you know, this is true, you, you're not flying for more than um, you know, one to two hours at a time. Um, but there are some within our fleet and certainly in operational flyers that can be extended uh, long, you know, long beyond this. And also there's a phenomenon called hot refuels where you may do back to back sorties, so land on the ground, but not actually get much time off the aircraft whilst it's refueled and ready to continue flying. The mobile option uh, is something like this uh, middle picture called the piddle pouch um, and there's gel crystals within that that solidify the waste, uh, reducing spills uh, once you then go to stow it. Um, expert balance is needed to manage clothing, um, the bag and then any turbulence or sort of vibration that may be going on uh, in the open cabin whilst you uh, try to use it and, and again just consider using this with female anatomy whilst in um, usually male design. Within the fast jet, uh, well, the piddle pack is also used, um, but we also have some fleets, namely the F-35, which are using um, electrical pump devices like this AMXD, which is uh, pictured here on the right, and uh, the pump uh, activates. You have um, either a cup system like on the left or a pad on the right for, for women, and um, when they're activated, they draw urine away uh, and store it. So you put it on underneath your flying clothing, it's used, um, in effect hands-free so you have much more um, situational awareness and, and don't get task saturated in the same way that you may do whilst trying to um, sit like this uh, individual here in the, the cockpit um, whilst potentially unstrapping and, and trying to put a, a, a piddle pouch into position to enable use. So urinating whilst flying is something that has to be approached with significant caution and um, superb timing to enable it to be successful and not present any additional risk to the flying task that you're under undertaking at the time. Um, so in many UK military aircraft there are challenging differences between ground and air toilet facilities as we've, we've just briefly run through. Um, so you've really got three choices when managing the need to go. Uh, you can urinate using these options. Uh, or you could reduce your volume through dehydration. I think we've already touched on why that uh, isn't a great idea within the uh, the flying world. 
uh, or you can hold on and hope that you can ignore the urge long enough to safely land uh, without causing any significant destruction. So looking first at urination, uh, we've talked through some of these challenges already. Um, the flying kit you're wearing, including in some conditions an immersion suit, which aims to be watertight in both directions. So gaining access through the zip that you're there can be challenging for both men and women. There are very differing levels of privacy, as we've discussed, compared with the ground. Um, and this takes adjusting to, you know, it's a cultural change from what you're used to. Um, and you may also require some retraining in, in how you urinate in this workplace. We pride ourselves on becoming potty trained when we're young. And now we are, you know, are putting Echo in a position where they have to retrain themselves to be able to sit in their, their workplace, in effect, and urinate. And sometimes the angle of the seat means this could be an uphill task uh, for female air crew. And uh, add turbulence in an open cabin and, and we really do change the environment and make it challenging to urinate. So it may well be that um, behavioural changes are made to then avoid the need for urination. So let's have a look at dehydration. Um, there are common symptoms of dehydration as we touched on that concur with only minimal amounts of body percentage um, weight loss. Headaches, the dryness, uh, reduced physical performance and a cognitive deficit similar to being at the UK drink driving and, and, and this is an important comparison um, because we do not tolerate alcohol in flying, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a legal situation if you turn up to work at being un, uh, you know, unfit for duties. Um, Additionally, there are air medical consequences of, of relevance uh, to do with dehydration. So flight performance was impaired in a flight simulator study. More flight errors were made when dehydrated. Um, endurance to acceleration force profiles uh, is reduced by nearly 50%. Um, there's increased risk of decompression illness. And as mentioned before, the heat illness risk will also increase if you are dehydrated. From a genitourinary health perspective, UTIs may be more prevalent and urinary incontinence symptoms, um, symptoms rather may also be more prevalent. Many reasons why we would at least expect fluid intake to match ground days and increase when there are heat or environmental demands um, so that we don't expose ourselves to these additional risks that present themselves within a flying environment. Now your final option is to just hold on, which many of us do when, uh, you know, probably when waiting for lecture to finish or a journey to end. Um, but this becomes maladaptive when uh, there's an additional risk within the situation presented by holding. So that distraction that takes place, um, you know, your bladder is shouting loud and clear that it needs you to release. And that signal only gets stronger and stronger. Um, it's, it's near on impossible to, to ignore it and make it go away. Um, the Daily Mail will tell you that bladder rupture is risk. That, that is unlikely um, in this scenario, but repeated stretching of the bladder nerves may lead to nerve dysfunction, resulting in incontinence and bladder stretch, increasing the UTI risk due to, to pooling of urine within this. And then the dystonia so from this bladder stretch may also reduce the functional bladder size, increasing urinary frequency, which makes the whole scenario even worse if you need to go uh, more than you do. So this led uh, these interrelated problems to come together to form the basis of the research study that was undertaken. Um, I had a great uh, research supervisor, so uh, Dr. Pete Hopkinson, who you've also heard from within this lecture series uh, at King's, and an anonymous um, online survey was circulated amongst UK military air crew. And this underwent full sort of Ministry of Defence Research Ethic Committee um, uh, review and favourable opinion to enable us to do this, because this was a um, you know a sensitive topic that that dug deep into things. It was of course anonymous, um, but still uh, led people to some some deep thinking and some uh, you know interesting sharing of anecdotes and their own experiences. Um, we probed into the hydration and the urination habits. Uh, explore what may preclude individuals from using provided devices and facilities and explored whether there are any significant um, genetic urinary disturbance uh, presence that you know that they wanted to share with us uh, it was analyzed for uh, the influence of gender and also dug further into female specific problems that may present so there was a large section uh, on contraception use and uh, whether um, this was being used to try and manage menstrual flow how menstrual flow was managed if, if present uh, during flying 
um, <clears throat> and we used a, a sort of an international continents questionnaire uh, to have a look at both separately male um, genital urinary symptoms and female genital urinary symptoms so we could compare it with um, equivalent populations uh, which was a fascinating study to, to be done. Um, the results, as I said, are fascinating and have been prepared for publication, so I can't go into them into too much depth. Um, but what we certainly saw was a change in fluid intake on flying versus non-flying days. And surprisingly, this was a decrease in fluid. So um, air crew were, appeared to be reducing their um, intake. And we saw this to a greater degree in female air crew. Um, many barriers uh, were identified from the kit being worn to their role within the aircraft due to the operational mission that might prevent them moving about um, some of the aircraft that had flight decks rather than cockpits con confining them to one area. Um, thankfully, no significant impact on physical health was found, um, but there were some issues with the shame and embarrassment identified. So um, lots of the data gathered um, should help design um, future systems, so we'll be supportive by, by sharing it um, in a peer-reviewed way. Um, but we've also sort of had some immediate benefit uh, and um, the Air Force have been fantastic in uh, adopting some of the findings into the training that we provide to our medical officers uh, and medical teams uh, through an aviation medicine perspective and also in the aviation medicine training that we, we give our air crew. Um, so I hope to share more of the results with time. Um, Bringing this evening to a close, I want to highlight uh, why aviation medicine clinicians uh, need to delve deep. And I hope you've really appreciated that from this, that, uh, you know, no topic is off limits when you're looking at um, supporting the performance of their crew and maintaining, uh, you know, the safety of themselves and potentially passengers. Um, to make the most of the machine where there is crew on board, we will be tasked to optimise the performance to ensure they are enhancing, not hindering operations through their presence. And this is going to become even more relevant as more and more automated machines uh, join the skies um, that you know, your next generation uh, will be leading. So the human uh, in any system really will have to be optimised and, and not presenting any additional risk to the sorties that are going on. Um, thus, all basic human needs will be able to, uh, will need to be catered for to avoid distraction and, and situational awareness consumption. Um, the need to wee is a basic human need, um, but getting it wrong can limit and, at worst case, terminate a sortie. And this is no different in space exploration, um, as SpaceX have uh, recently sort of shared. Uh, I love this picture. The uh, cupola at the top is where the toilet allegedly is on the uh, SpaceX's uh, Dragon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there appeared to be some leak uh, in a recent mission, and uh, I can only imagine uh, that you know Earth plumbers are costly enough, let alone having space plumbers come on board. Um, but you know, basic human needs is a consideration in whatever we need to do. So there are lots and lots of um, ideas for for future research and and development in this area. So. Thank you for joining me tonight and please do get in touch if there is anything you wish to discuss further. Um, as you can probably tell, I've really loved my um, sort of aerospace medicine uh, career that I've undertaken so far as a GP and I've really enjoyed undertaking research in um, you know, recent times, something I didn't do at medical school. Um, there are really so many research areas possible within aviation medicine and certainly some significant research gaps if you have any interest in women's health issues. Um, so please do get in touch. Um, the next thing I'm hoping to look at is menopause and aviation and how this impacts um, female air crew in the later stages of their career. Um, just as an example of, of things that are going on, and, and certainly King's has a fantastic programme if you're interested in taking aerospace medicine further. Um, but very best of luck with your path in aerospace medicine. And if you have any questions or uh, want to talk through anything, didn't understand anything in the talk, I'm more than happy to be contacted um, sort of through email or, um, or via Twitter. So just uh, keep in touch and very best of luck. Good night. and.